Barbara is an art and architecture historian, a curator, an art advisor, and also uh, the founder of Art Intelligentsia. Um, thank you so much for being here, and we also want to thank Alex <laughs> for all your help uh, with this event. Uh, this, this show is open through Saturday, and the second part of the exhibition opens in Semrits on July 28th. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, thank you. Hey Dobby, everybody, thank you for coming. Um, so this means a lot to me, because I've known the Posen family for as long as I've been in New York, for 20 years. And I've been following Steven's work um, ever since, and I certainly learned a lot from him um, about painting, about history, and about being in the art world. Um, so today we're here to see some of his earliest work, um, the work that he did in the Lower East Side when he moved back from Florence after two years in a full bright spend in Italy. Um, Stephen had studied with uh, uh, fellow artists Richard Serra and um, uh, Nancy Craves at Yale. And uh, after that, he got a full bright, moved to Italy, and started doing these actually sculptural works. Uh, that were being to be and look like abstract expressionist sculptures. Uh, if you see pictures of the studio which the uh, gallery will publish in a monograph coming out, I think for the San Morris opening. Exactly. Yes. Um, you see that the, the book is amazing and it reproduces these images uh, that uh, feature Stephen in his studio in Florence where you can see these gigantic works that are extremely expressive and would have been really cool to see, but I think most of them got destroyed or lost. Um, and then he moved back to New York. And um, so we're speaking about 1964-66 in Italy and back to New York in 67. And um, the works around here are from 68 with the banana that we're going to come and see. <laughs> So this is a, just to give you like a few pointers about you know where we are in history. Number one, the Lower East Side is the it place. You have to be there. Like this is where minimalism is developing. So Lloyd is having his studio. Conceptual art is being developed. Uh, this is also um, the years of uh, pop art. Andy Warhol is shot in 1968, right? So there is this uh, parallelism between the development of uh, geometrical linear abstraction, where the line has a very strong presence, and the grid also. And then on the other hand, you have pop art that is uh, still very strong, and um, it is seen where the um, new that the post that is uh, new that is you know Duchamp had uh, had an amazing impact. Um, scene. And so you have people like Rashenberg and Jasper Jones who are transitioning from this European tradition into the American scene. And somebody like Stephen Posen would have been very close to the spirit of Jasper Jones. So this is where I want to start actually. So we're back in New York, right? You know the scene. And um, Stephen comes here and he is dropping his abstract expressionist sculptures. In his heart, he's not a sculptor, he's a painter. And for him, you have the backdrop not only of what I've been just speaking about in the art the history, uh, the contemporary art history in New York, but there is also the Vietnam War. And the question in everybody's mind is how do we paint today? Right? Uh, what is the role of painting? Uh, how can painting be meaningful? And um, there is, uh, in, 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 around him, this presence of these very uh, divided tendencies. One toward pure abstraction that is flinging itself completely off from political events, right? And then there is another one um, that he looks up to uh, and especially, like I was just saying, Jasper Jones, who 
uh, in uh, the 50s and early uh, 60s is uh, producing uh, artworks that are made out of bronze and paint, painted bronze being you know, the sum up of everything that he wants to speak about. Um, so we're going back to paint and we're going back to bronze. Uh, it's not a ready-made anymore, it's not an object that you're buying, it's an object that you're painting, so you're going back toward the classical means of making art, and yet you are addressing the daily objects of our American society and our living with cans of beers, the American flag, and things like that. So we are uh, moving back from this radical uh, uh, looking at, um, at uh, objects that have not yet had a history in art and, in, and that the pop art had uh, appropriated, we're going back on um, painterly objects in the tradition of the elders. And Stephen is back from Florence, right? So he spent a year seeing Donatello, he spent a year seeing Piotr Francesca, seeing all of these amazing artworks. And when we're speaking about these, of course, you know, we're looking at the banana, which I want to start with because um, when Stephen started, he started with upscale objects. And if you look at the objects around you on the walls, they're in scale, they're one on one, right? So there's a difference at this very moment. But early on in 1968, when he is addressing uh, the uh, painterly uh, object, so dropping back the ready made, right, and moving on to back to paint. And he's doing something that you would call, you know, if you're really pompous, a counter relief or a cut out of an object um, that is out of scale and it's pretty funny, right? It's a banana. It's not an object of consumption that has been made by a, a manufacturer or the industry, but it's a product of nature that you eat and you throw on the floor and somebody's going to slip on it. Why am I saying that? Because at first when um, Stephen is asking himself what is the role of painting today? What do we do with painting? Is painting still looked up to in the way it was? It's something that he really loves. And he is um, evoking uh, Claude Monet's uh, work by painting a bridge. But he's painting it on wood, plywood. So the way that he does it is that he draws right, the bridge on plywood and then he cuts it out and then he paints it. But he makes it in a way that you can walk on the bridge, so that the bridge of Giverny that you see in the water movies of, of uh, Claude Monet, you can actually find it there as something to walk on. So the displacements of this you know, painterly icon into an object of commercialization that you can actually walk on and this, you know, um, toying with uh, the idea of uh, the work of art as a commodity and what has become to, to painting and where we're going is where he starts off. And then he's looking at all of these absurd elements that, you know, why not paint that about a knife? You can walk on the bridge of Colomone, you know, as a painting. Can you just like split on, slip on a banana? And um, it's a wonderful item, I think, when you know Stephen and how serious he is, but also how funny he is, and how the art that he's making is always walking that line, where he's playing with reality, but he's also reflecting very seriously on reality. And um, so this is an item of wood that is painted, and if you look at it, it's painted all the way to the edges. Um, and the edges is a, is a line that is kind of supple and flickering. And Stephen says, you know, at the time I considered myself a um, conceptual realist. So what is a conceptual realist? It's somebody who, on one hand, has concept in his brain, just like Donatello and Da Vinci did. Um, meaning that, you know, Da Vinci said, art is about an idea. It's an idea first, then it's a making. So you have first the concept that comes, and art, the art of the design, of designing, and uh, Madeleine was just showing me a beautiful little book that Stephen has of his sketches, and the sketches of undergarment, and the sketches of all these things that he was planning to do, and how he was planning to pin them. And so you see coming with the design, the design, the idea, the concept. 
So the concept is right there. And again, you know, in line with Jasper Jones, that it's not coming from the form and the paint and the loose aspects of, let's say, abstract expressionist, where not necessarily coming from the idea, but from the motion. Here he's coming from a concept, and then he's moving also into illusion. The other aspect of uh, the uh, conceptual realist is that the realism, right? The illusion of life making. Much like if you look at the scacciato of Donatello, there is the illusion of life. He's got to represent the Virgin Mary with a baby, right? And he's got to stick to it because that's what everybody expects from it. And yet on the artistic side, he's got to have a conceptual idea of what he's going to do. And one is key to both Donatello and his cousin, if I may say, is the line. And it's the expression of the line. Does the expression of that you know, outline that we're speaking about, that we're speaking If you look at line, is there a way, in fact, in painting to get away from line? That's a really good question. And when you're thinking about Stephen being on the Lower East Side, right, next to Solo Wit, and to all these minimalists, they're never very much preoccupied by the line, except they're not realists, they're abstractionists, right? So you have this line, and this line is like creating this uh, stain in the banana, and the outline of the cutout is creating all these shadows, uh, and then it's creating color, and all these uh, placement of several lines are creating color. And Stephen said, at the time, I was up to finding out what the line was about. And this is his formalist aspect. You're seeing his humorous aspect, and you know, I spoke already enough about the conceptual element. But I think it is a question that he's embracing at that time that is a very old question. It's a question, like I said, that starts with Donatello. How do you create the Virgin Mary? And it's not going to be boring, it's going to be expressive. And his lines in the scacchetto, in the very slim um, counter relief that he's applying. Um, and sculpting uh, out of marble very often and applying to the walls are going to appear pictorial lines that are expressive and are departing from naturalism even though they're sticking to a certain level of realism. And this is, I think, what is very much present here. Then he switches from the objects that is closer to, let's say, you know, you could say post class uh, Oldenburg, right? Um, and we all know that every artist kind of has objects that is attached to them. So Jones, you know, the flag and the cans of beer, the cans of paint. Um, Oldenburg, toothpaste and um, cigarette butts. And if there is an object that we think of when we think of Stephen Posen, it's definitely drapery, um, especially in his room. And drapery and then boxes, and these drapery and cloths that are made out of fabric and lines that are made out of fabric and then evolved in his work to transform but stay very much close to this uh, possibility of transformation and metamorphosis that closing has. Closing has, of course, um, come, and especially drapery, to uh, uh, represent symbolically what is the achievement in art. You could not, as a Renaissance artist, claim to be a painter and not be able to represent the drapery. The drapery was your test. Um, the, it was the um, passage obligé, right? You had to be able to master drapery. And then, if, so you see in these Renaissance studios, drapery is being the motif that you have to to absolutely master. You fast forward Velasquez, we're still not out of it, right? Drapery is still right there. You fast forward to Anna, uh, drapery is still freakish there. You get to David, the drapery is still there. Drapery, why for Stephen Posen? In some ways, it's something that he transmitted to his children, to Bozak and to Alex. Drapery is theater, it's the theatricality. Is the mise en scène, and all that you're seeing around you has been put together as a model, as a construct, right? So the designer is not only coming from the drawing, but it's coming then in 3D as a construct, and it's the one-on-one -on -one scale that happens then past the banana, as 1968, 
we have this one-on-one -on -one relationship where just like in the studios of the Renaissance, you would have a 3D model. So Da Vinci cheated a bit, not like Stephen. He dipped the fabric into plaster and created a drapery that would stand on its own and would be its own model. So the thing is that, of course, it's much easier to paint still lives because they're so much more patient than any live model. So when you're looking at these draperies that are evoking figuration and a human body without the human body being there, they are kind of cool because they are super patient. They're, you can pin them there, they're going to stay there. You know, Stephen would like have them, I would say, live in the studio, right? And um, applying himself to looking at them from different angles and representing them exactly as they were. Now, he did not use photography, he's not a photorealist. He's somebody who really had the same approach, as I said, as this Renaissance artist, as Anne has, you know, all this tradition. The first time I came to the show, I thought to myself, oh my god, this looks like a Manet, like the black is just the same. This was a tackling of Manet, and at the same time, of course, there's some minimalism attached to the color black and all of that. But, and I looked at some of the others, and was like, oh, this is definitely like a 19th century drapery. This is not, this is a much earlier drapery, like a 17th century. So in um, very much being somebody of his time and being in relationship with conceptual realism and you know, post dadaist work and coming back from the ready image to painting and addressing you know, what he's painting today in the 1960s, he's also exploring his relationship with the history of art and he can do a Monet like black and textile and he can do a 19th century classical drapery and he can do something that looks closer to a 19th century. This is something that Stephen has in him. He's a hell of a painter basically, but right? he can do it. So there is this aspect. And then you have this last one where Madeline is standing that is really evoking a coming back towards something that is detached from the figuration and moving more toward a certain level of abstraction and um, uh, of that uh, color contrast uh, and evocation of something that stands for itself, more on its own, outside of a reference to the um, to our daily work. Yet, the banana, the um, river edge, named after where his wife's parents were living, um, some of the draperies that I said, you know, are part of the theatricality that he runs in his family. Um, all of this, and there's another one that is Susan Wardrobe, evoke also very personal um, associations with cloth. And um, the hand of the painter is not only, like I said, in the painting, but also in the orchestration of uh, the object and its composition. Um, so um, there is, um, to go back to the line, thanks James, think about <laughs> it uh, To go back to the line, so I told you we have this object, you know, the scale of one on one in the studio, and here you have kind of a hybrid, you know, a little bit of a combine, if you want to use, you know, Rashomon's uh, expression. And this is one of my favorites, and in 1969, a man was Ivan Park, who was the director of the Leo Castelli um, gallery and had been following his work and you know, Stephen would go to Leo Castelli's and with his work in hand and show him um, to Ivan and Ivan would say, oh, good, good, good. it's very good. And until then, it had been very good. And then he saw this one, surprisingly enough, he said, it's not formalist enough. So Stephen went back to the studio and made three of them the same. So the formal aspect that kind of model, um, modular thinking that the minimalists were doing, repeating the formal concept, all right? So he has this full radio repainted that is like a gentle counter relief and it's become an object in some say, going back in the cubits to this, you know, the, the element of the objects on the, in, in the painting and really like expanding the modernist concept of the adventure of the painting out of the wall. This painting is not hanging on the wall, it's suspended, right? So it's moving away from the salon painting, the frame. There's no frame, the contours cut out. 
is hanging on a clause, is making an object, is still conceptual, very much so. It's very much illusionistic, but it's also very funny. And it's meant to hang in a way that art objects have never hanged before. So here he is, and he goes back to the studio next three of them, and he makes three, and he shows them the form of this form that you can repeat. And not only that, but this is for me the one that is the closest also to minimalism, because again, of the black color. So today I was on the phone with him and I said, what about these tuxedos? I don't see you in tuxedos. <laughs> and you know, I would get associated the tuxedo to the gala, to the glamour, to showing off, you know. And this, I couldn't see Stephen in the 60s or the early 70s with that. And he said, no, don't even know where I found them. You can say it was my wedding one. I said, no, I don't say that if it wasn't. But basically, there's also that culture of gathering garments, right? Gathering these garments. These garments that are, again, a testimony of being able to give the illusion that everybody is being able to capture to prove that they are good artists. And yet, moving this into you know, what is art today and how do we do so? And then there is also this loving, loving relationship that he has of man, to man, for Manet um, that you see in the glass and in the shine, uh, the way that the brushstroke disappears, and the way that this still um, underlying um, cloth of silk or something in the pocket is popping back up. Um, so, this is definitely one of my favorite. And I have to show you also this one. Um, just to go over, as I was looking at it, this is the one that demonstrates really the ease that um, Stephen has with paint. And it moves uh, from the black, you know, jacket with the tuxedo, that has plenty of yellow in it. If you look at this black, it's full of yellow, and it has this amazing greenish uh, shades. Um, and all of them, you know, if he was there, we'd say, well, is it a shade, or is it a line, or what is it? Is it the surface? And to me, it's just a demonstration of the, how many blacks can you get to recreate the black jacket, right? Um, there is not this flat, black solid. It's an array of colors that are actually constituting a relationship with the real color black, right, a perception of it. And then you move on to this part where we go from black to white. And in this, in this white, you do um, see a much more painterly, much more presence of the traces that uh, Stephen is uh, letting himself uh, show dry traces of paint, much more wet traces of paint, and these much more constructed uh, um, episodes here where things are going back and forth in the fourth plan and the third plan. And how do you penetrate right, into the wall and come forward when you're on a flat surface that pretends to be a high relief, but it's not, it's perfectly flat. Only the contour maybe has uh, the occasion of moving back and forth and projecting a shadow on the wall. And then I saw this. And if you were to show me a close-up of this and tell me who's this artist, you know, I would say this is Stephen Posen. And Stephen trained me the first time I go into his studio. I was a very young art student. And he showed me all sorts of close-ups of um, famous paintings, more or less famous. And each time he would say, which artist is it? And he knew there was like a tiny little detail. And I had to concentrate on the brush strokes to figure out who it was. And to his surprise, I was able to do it. But now I'm able to do it within. If I see something like this, only Stephen can do this. And so you do see that from the perfectly illusionistic, absent, you know, this kind of anonymous touch that became very famous with, let's say, Elsewhere Kelly. Um, to the moves here where we have Stephen Posen personally very present in a perfect abstraction, in a close-up of paint, um, giving us the illusion of a theatrical hanging that is put together himself as his own interior world and relationship with what is paint today and how can I further the questioning that pictorial arts have asked themselves since you know the beginning of um, art, basically. And then you have on the side this going back to this very intricate, fashion-like drapery that I can still see in his son's work, by the way. I mean, Zach is a great designer, and he specializes in drapery. And I can't even imagine that this has not 
being an influence on him and he's kind of hiding the drapery of these kind of figures like this other aspect that is not completely ever abstract that there's always an inner joke that however serious Stephen Posen gets he's always happy and there's always something solid in it and then finally like in this room we're on a kind of a somber interior type of ballet you know like neoclassical I would say in, in, in its um, uh, color um, evocation and then you go back to the bright green and to um, the possibilities of blacks from, um, you can see it from here, the vegetable has some green in it, blue and green. Um, and um, the uh, evocation of um, shadows through uh, beautiful lights. And we're moving back to a certain, um, like I said, construct and abstraction. And this will be the next step for Stephen. So after all of this, he leaves um, the cutouts behind and um, he um, had transitioned from wood to aluminum. He has spoken apparently to Alex Katz who said, because he was complaining how hard it is to cut plywood. And Alex Katz said, why don't you use aluminum? Only, you know, minimalists are doing it. So he's like, oh, okay. So he uses aluminum, which is the one here. And it's a, it's a phase in the work that leads him back to um, eventually painting on canvas and creating these constructions in the studio of boxes with cloth hanging and moving back to a certain level of abstraction. So um, the uh, OK Harris, um, so I spoke to you about Ivan Moore who said this is too far less. After he comes back with you know, three iterations, Ivan Moore welcomes him in the gallery and leaves Leo Castelli and takes Stephen into his um, new endeavor, one of the first uh, West Broadway gallery and really created the history downtown of the art scene. And Stephen is part of that and he's um, represented by O.K. Harris who also shows Wayne Hansen, that rings a bell for anybody, um, this um, really exemplary photorealist um, type but not working from photo again working from an illusion of the body and an incredibly social criticism, very political work within the gallery. And um, also somebody like Malcolm Morley who has a relationship with visual world and figuration which borders on interaction. So this group in the UK Harris Gallery were really artists who didn't um, um, we didn't settle for um, the way that figuration had been um, talk to them, I guess, through history and we're pushing it forward. And we're also people who were very much conceptually thinking in an abstract manner. And where, um, uh, whether it was in their relationship to the 2D image of photography and this detachment from uh, the live model or to the contrary, casting live model, but they were all struggling in some ways with what is it today to be an artist and to represent what reality is. And so you have then Stephen who looks at the reality of an, um, representation that is abstract, that is non figurative, but still looks very much in his construction um, present, illusionistic, and related to the world as we know it and also to the conceptual uh, world of painting in its geometry, in its evocation of formalist questions and the line. And so in that way, he's really bridging the world of conceptual realism and the world of abstraction that he's always been a great fan of. So I think this is, you know, I'm really much, very much looking forward to the catalog coming out and this animal's show. And, um, if you have any questions, thank you anyway for coming. If you have any questions, please let me know.
the panel decoration. Uh, right. Right. So by the time he got to the boxes, he really was more indexed on one hand to conceptual abstraction and the illusion of it being present as a 3D object. Can you all? I just want yeah. to say that you know, in 72, Ali was living in Soho, which at that time was still the factories. And so there were many uh, fabric and garment factories and remnants and, you know, fabric and what even my brother built really materials at hand there, um, but I don't know that he did pattern picked yeah. uh, decorative fabric, it seems like. No, 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 this is the, the larger sense of the sort of movement towards pattern and decoration of PNP movement itself, yeah. which, you know, was somewhat coming out of California, but also yeah. I don't the way so she was, I mean, in some ways, it's such an extraordinary sort of prequel to it in, in many ways. Creating a sense of, of course, this, this flatness, but of course, still referencing the volume. Yeah. yeah. Any other question? I'm curious about scale and um, uh, the banana is larger. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then a couple of these have references to scale, which are here. Right. These, yeah. These don't. Um, I think the human scale became a preoccupation, honestly. I mean, uh, I, I do think that, of course, you know, Stephen's work on loving abstract expressions and um, Barton Newman, you know, the human scale, the famous quote, there's something to it. I also think that there's the, it's the presence, the theatrical presence. There's something that is not then about representation, but it's about presentation. Um, and there is a, this, this real physicality that is not toying with the surrealist aspect, like you could say with Oldenburg, right? To some extent, you know, there's still surrealism hanging out. The playfulness of Stephen's um, work comes from the illusion and the references of these objects to his private life or to life as, you know, I mean, less so. Um, to the, the humorous aspect that can come from changing scale and making it, you know, smaller. It's not even the um, the lifelike aspect as much as the authentic presence. I don't know what you would say, but that's how I feel it. You know, um, like something came out of, of, a, of a thread, and it may be just because also I'm coming back from Rome and I was talking to him and I said, what about Cinema, Italian cinema, you know, all of these films that are filming clothes hanging on the cloth, right? That is one of the almost the trope of, of, of Italy, right? You see the like, clothes hanging on the cloth. And this is what you see in a lot of these early paintings. Um, and he just have come back from Italy. Most likely he didn't think of it, but it's in the back of his mind. There is this relationship to so many forms of representation that are presenting the world as it is. And that's a form of realism and you know, this indexing on, on really the, the way that people live. And to me that's what the scale is about. Yeah. Anybody else?